Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Longsight, Some Dude 267, Joshua Long, and Ohio Trucker 1. You are the reason why this content remains American! And today, we have another story of a long-lost locomotive in America. But not just any place in America, because, as a result of my last video where I discussed a sunken train in Connecticut, several other people have come out asking me to find other sunken trains in their various locations. And one came to me from the great state of... Texas? That's right, Texas. And well, howdy there, Pilgrim. I tell you what, I think I found a good old tale to tell you down here in the great state of Texas. Mm hmm This is the story of the loss of Texas and Pacific engine number 642. Let's lay some groundwork and some background, like we always do. What is the Texas and Pacific Railroad? Well, TNP was actually created by Federal Charter in 1871, and it was created specifically to build a southern transcontinental railroad between Marshall, Texas, and San Diego, California. TNP never actually made it to San Diego. Instead, they met the Southern Pacific Railroad in Sierra Blanca, Texas in 1881. Missouri Pacific actually gained a majority ownership for TNP in 1928, but they allowed them to continue operation as a separate entity until they were eventually merged in 1976. Missouri Pacific would actually be purchased by Union Pacific in 1980, but due to some legal issues, they didn't officially merge until 1997. That being said, Texas and Pacific was a pretty dominant railway in the 1870s. A standard gauge operation, they handled both freight and passenger service for the region. But by 1885, they had some financial problems, and on top of that, that particular spring was known for its very heavy rainfall. By March 15th, what's known as Village Creek was experiencing flooding conditions with a very dangerous current. As a part of TNP's lines, there was a bridge that went over Village Creek. It had been hastily put together in 1876 because it needed to lay track west from Eagle Ford to Fort Worth. The bridge may have only been nine years old, but it already needed repairs. The Snipes had actually reported this to the railroad company, and they hadn't really gotten around to making permanent fixes to it just yet. Snipes, by the way, is a term for railroad workers who inspect the condition of tracks and bridges. It's literally their job to make sure things are safe. The heavy rain significantly hampered repair efforts, although on March 9th a repair crew did temporarily shore up the bridge with supporting timbers. But the heavy rain was making their job very difficult, and TNP was experiencing a union strike at the time. A lot of their usual workers were currently walking at a picket line, and instead of fixing their repair work, the crew had decided to say the heck with it and join their fellow workers in the line. Because of the continued downpour and high water level, the temporary supports that had been added to the bridge to keep it stable actually tore away and were swept downstream. Snipes would have probably caught this problem and warned the railway, but TNP had actually laid them off due to their financial situation and the strike, so there was no one to check the bridge. It was a Sunday morning, March 15th. Lyman Stacy Roach arrived at the TNP roundhouse to pick up his engine, engine number 642. 642, as you can see, is a classic American model. A 440 wheel arrangement, we've mentioned these plenty of times before. They were a mainstay on America's railways for decades, and in fact got plenty of use overseas as well. 642 wasn't the largest American around, but it did weigh 73,000 pounds, so it wasn't exactly light. It had been constructed in the 1870s by Manchester Locomotive Works of New Hampshire. Engineer Roach's fireman for the day was one J.G. Hobbock. 642 used wood for its fuel, and Hobbock loaded it up, and they drove the locomotive to pick up their train at the passenger depot. The train was number 304. It had a mail car, a baggage car, a smoker car, what was known as a ladies' car, and a sleeper car. Now, before anyone asks, what is a ladies car exactly? Well, it's oddly specific, and yeah, it was. It was quite literally a ladies only passenger car. The reason for this was twofold. On one hand, and some countries in the modern age still do it for this reason, it was meant to prevent sexual harassment. But back then in America, it was probably more because husbands didn't want to deal with their wives nagging when they were chilling in the smoker car on the train. 
the ladies had to stay in their own car. I think we've come a long way as a society based on that, I'm just saying. I don't think Amtrak would get away with this kind of thing now, especially if that was the reason. But it's not really that important, I just wanted to answer that question before anyone asked me. Now back to 642. When they were between Handley and Arlington, 642 was approaching the bridge over Village Creek. Now, Engineer Roach was by no means a fool and completely understood the situation he may face. He was born in Ohio in 1845, and he was a resident of Texacana. When he was younger, he was a cabin boy on a river steamboat, and he fought for the Union in the Civil War, surviving 90 days as a POW. And he had enough experience to know the dangers of the possible flood conditions of the creek. He eased 642 along the rails towards the bridge. The angle he was at didn't allow him to see the condition of the creek just yet, and he was only going about 12 miles per hour. Despite this, when he realized how high the creek water was, just four feet below the bridge, he slammed on the air brake. Unfortunately, the train did not stop, possibly owed to the wet conditions of the rails. As 642 ran out onto the bridge, the supports could not take the weight. They snapped, and the bridge collapsed. As 642 fell into the raging water, it dragged both the mail car and the baggage car along with it. The baggage car wound up lying partially submerged and almost vertical. The smoker car dangled over the edge of the bridge. The ladies' car and the sleeper car had derailed, but they were otherwise all right, still safe on solid ground. The conductor on board that day, a gentleman by the name of Kellogg, was apparently the first member of the train crew to get out of the safe cars on the train and figure out what exactly had happened. He took count of those that were missing, including Engineer Roach and Fireman Hobbock. Every passenger on board the train was absolutely fine. But seven crew members were not accounted for, and he managed to organize some of the passengers to help search for the missing. The five crew members that had been in the mail car and the baggage car managed to escape and swim ashore. All but one had some injuries, but they were otherwise all right and would recover. At the same time, Engineer Roach managed to emerge from the creek. He was badly injured and struggled to stay above the water as he fought the current. Several of the male passengers actually jumped into the creek to pull Roach to safely. They were successful, but he needed immediate medical attention. They used the sleeper carts to administer what first aid they could, and a messenger was dispatched to Hanley so they could telegraph for emergency medical assistance and a rescue train. As for Fireman J.G. Habeck, he was not found on that day, and they presumed that he must be dead. The rescue train did arrive, and cleanup began. The injured crewmen were taken to the Missouri Pacific Railroad Hospital in Fort Worth. Out of them, Engineer Roach had the most serious injuries. He had a crushed lung, broken leg, and multiple contusions. They did not expect him to survive. The same day as the accident, that afternoon, the railroad had managed to convince some of the workers that were picketing to temporarily leave their strike to help clear the track out of the accident. This process was incredibly difficult, owed to the flood conditions and the fact that the bridge was in tatters. It took place over a few days, and as they were preparing to recover the engine, tender, and the two cars, they did find the body of Fireman Haddock. He was a half mile downstream from where the engine had gone into the water. The muddy conditions meant they couldn't position horses close enough to actually pull on the records. 642's great weight compared to the coaches also meant it had sunk into the creek bottom quite a bit. After a few days of efforts, they did manage to pull the mail car and the baggage car out of the creek, but they completely gave up on 642. She was not budging, and it was no longer worth the expense or man hours. They did manage to fix the bridge, and rail service on that line was resumed by early April. Fireman J.G. Habeck would actually be the sole death from the accident, as miraculously, Engineer Roach managed to make a recovery. Despite how extensive his injuries were, he would be able to get back some semblance of normalcy for himself, though he would walk with a limp for the rest of his life. He would also never drive a locomotive again. Instead, he became a merchant in Texacana, and in 1905 was appointed postmaster. He lived out the rest of his days there, dying in 1915. As for Engine 642, 137 years later, it's apparently still exactly where it was left, in the creek, buried under the sediment. There was apparently a time when the locomotive was actually visible when the creek was at normal level. A gentleman by the name of Walter Darr, who was a resident of Hanley born in 1900, and a retired railroad employee himself, says that he recalled swimming around the engine's cowcatcher and smokestack as a kid in 1912. He said at the time that it was resting nose up at a 45 degree angle. In 1929, Texas and Pacific actually rebuilt the bridge using more modern materials like steel and concrete. The workers say they actually found the engine, but they left it be. In 1936, a gentleman by the name of Charles Stockman, who was also a retired Texas and Pacific worker, actually managed to dig out part of the smokestack of 642 from the mud. Thing was, 
He didn't actually find the rest of the engine. The belief is that this smokestack may have broken off in the accident, and what Stockman found was just a piece of 642 that had been moved by the current further downstream. As of the time of me recording this video, no one has attempted to use a magnometer to see if they can figure out exactly where 642 is buried. Some people think the engine actually isn't there, as it may have been raised in later years and cut up for scrap. But others dispute this based on the fact that there's no record of it ever happening, and that sort of activity, given how embedded 642 was in the mud, would have been really difficult to conceal if someone were trying to steal it. And there was allegedly an effort by somebody during World War II thinking they could raise number 642 for scrap, but apparently they gave up really quick when they realized how impossible it was going to be. And quite recently, apparently a developer came poking around the local area with the idea that since he had $1 million to invest in the project, he might be able to exhume 642, restore it, and put it on display at the renovated TNP passenger terminal downtown. A novel idea, as it is a piece of history, but uh, nothing ever came of it, because no one really knows exactly where it is, and because of this, it's hard to say what condition 642 could be in. I imagine many of its components have rusted pretty badly over the years, and even if it is found, I highly doubt it would ever run again, maybe for static display, maybe. My issue right now is, even if you do find it, how are you gonna get it out? The process of doing so would be incredibly expensive, incredibly expensive, and this is one case where people have legitimately tried to do it. All have failed. 642 seems pretty hell-bent on staying exactly where she is. And on top of that, allegedly, when Texas and Pacific was building the replacement bridge and found 642, the reason they left it is that they feared that if she were disturbed, the resulting earth-moving operation that would be needed to get her out of there would actually weaken the bridge they had built. And that's just one more thing you'd have to consider for such a project. I'm not saying she shouldn't be found, I'd love to know if she's still there, possibly exhumed to a certain extent, but it's going to take a lot of time, and a lot of money, to figure that out. Bare minimum, you'd need a magnometer. And even that could only be used to steer you in the right direction. So for now, I think 642 is going to stay right where she's at. Will it be forever? I don't know. I hope none of the trains I talk about are going to stay where they're at forever. But I have to be real with you. The notion of someone spending the amount of money you need to do this is a little outlandish. It's not unheard of, sure, but I won't get my hopes up. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.